All right, so today we're just going to review some, some fad diets. That's always a topic of discussion coming up on the new year. Uh, some research about weight loss and what diet should we follow for that. Some food safety tips for transplant recipients and then some holiday eating strategies. So let's get started. Oops. So this slide, these are some book covers that I happened to see at Barnes and Noble a few years ago. They're kind of funny, so I want to share them with you. First one, How Not to Die. This is a weight loss book that's suggested for reading. Why Kids Make You Fat. And of course, The Hypnotic Gastric Band. So these are just a few of the books that I saw and I thought they were worth capturing. So some common fad diets, the blood type diet, uh, eating a certain type of you know, eating pattern diet based on your blood type. The five bite diet, which allows you to eat five bites of any food. That's all the instruction they give you. Cabbage soup diet, that one we, we've heard about before. Same with the master cleanse or lemonade diet where you mix, mix lemonade, maple syrup, and some different spices and you drink that for a while. Baby food diet, enough said. So you get a jar of baby food, how appealing, right? Sleeping Beauty, this is one of my favorites. So the premise behind this one is that you take sleeping pills so you're asleep more than you're awake to prevent you from eating because you're sleeping. But you see here, she slept when she was eating. I guess that's an actual condition where people sleep eat and they don't even realize it till they wake up with crumbs in their bed. Okay, this one is the HCG or pregnancy hormone diet. So this involves taking an injection of the pregnancy hormone HCG in addition to following only 500 calories per day. So by default, you'll lose weight just from the calorie restriction, but interesting that you are injecting yourself with this hormone that pregnant people have. And then this slide is just an overview. Um, weight loss pills, cleanses, different diet fads. I mean, there's so many out there nowadays. I wanna uh, put focus on the top middle one, the Garcinia Cambogia supplement. So this one I like to talk about this was promoted by Dr. Oz maybe four or five years ago as a weight loss supplement. And this one here is a 100% pure supplement, but it's found mixed into a lot of different supplements in smaller amounts. Sometimes even in like a protein powder can be really anywhere. So this one, um, you know, really does it work? Probably not because we haven't heard of a cure-all, you know, magic pill for, for what, weight loss or diet. But then my also my transplant hack goes on because um, for anyone who's had a transplant, we advise against taking a herbal type of supplements and this falls into that category. Um, herbal supplements could increase the risk for rejection of your organ based on they interact with your transplant medications. An interesting story actually, I was seeing a patient for a liver transplant evaluation. She needed a liver transplant because she took the supplement and it caused liver failure. So kind of a double-edged thing um, weight loss, you know, it's questionable. Does it really work? And number two, the risk you take having um, medications that you're taking for transplant. Okay, so today we're going to talk about some diet trends, uh, which ones to consider and which ones to ditch. What does the research say about weight loss? Food safety, especially in terms of, you know, if you're a transplant recipient and some holiday eating strategies. So I want to start off with the definition of diet. So a lot of people have their own thoughts about what this word means, some positive, some neutral, and some negative explanations for the word diet. I throw this word around a lot, just talking about what kind of diet do you follow? Do you follow any special diets? Just meaning, you know, do you eat any certain way or tell me more about that? But it is defined as the kind of foods that a person eats or an animal or community habitually eats. So diet should not translate to restriction or cutting out entire food groups. But over time, the word diet has come to mean eating in smaller quantities or cutting out whole food groups. So I did a, a Google search about um, fad diets coming up now with the new year. And this is one I haven't heard of before, the CERT food diet. This has been um, gaining popularity in Europe. And for those of you who know the singer Adele, she had followed this diet and lost a significant amount of weight. So the premise is that foods contain groups of proteins or sirtuins, which may help play a role in metabolism and inflammation, which then will lead to weight loss. 
So some of the allowed foods are listed there. Um, one which I know a lot of people have commented, they're excited they can drink red wine on this diet. So that's something that draws them into it. Um, but it's important to note the initial phase of this diet includes liquid diet. So you're just drinking beverages for the first part and restricting calories. So that's um, what's seeming to cause weight loss. Okay, another very popular diet that we've all heard about is the ketogenic diet. Um, this has been around for, for quite a few years now as a weight loss diet, but it has only been proven evidence-based for people with uh, epilepsy or seizures. So this type of diet or um, macronutrient composition has been proven to help people with epilepsy, but people are now using it as weight loss. So a ketogenic diet is not the same as a low carb diet. So the difference is the keto diet requires very specific counting of what you eat. So the percentages are listed there. The 75 to 80% of calories come from fat. So that's like butter, oil, avocado, bacon grease, things like that is most of your diet. Then 5% of calories are from carbs, which as we know are in so many foods. Uh, or one example, an apple on this diet has too many carbs. So you can't even have one apple per day that would put you out of ketosis, uh, out of the, re the restrictions or allowances for the diet. And then like a normal amount of protein. Um, so really the premise is your body is um, no longer using carbs, which most of us, that's, that's how our body's burning energy. And we're restricting that and using fat to burn up your fat stores. So Overall, it's pretty difficult to maintain. I've seen a few people maintain it maybe for three to six months, but average my patients, I see one to two months just because it's, it's hard to maintain. Fruit and vegetable intake is pretty limited as well. Another common one I have been hearing about lately is the alkaline diet, especially in my patients who have chronic kidney disease, but it's becoming more of a, a buzzword around just the general population anyway. So the theory for the alkaline diet is that some food like meat, wheat, refined sugar, and processed foods cause your body to produce acid, which is not good, especially for some medical conditions. So the premise is to consume more alkaline foods to alter your, your body's pH. So those foods are like fruits and veggies, nuts and seeds. So in general, the diet focuses on eating you know, less processed foods, more fresh foods, which is good for anyone, but um, it's important to note if you're following this diet to change your blood pH to affect your metabolic or medical state, um, that's not going to happen. Your, your, your pH is tightly regulated by your body. Diet can't change that. Um, so some diets to consider. These are a few um, that have been around for a few years that um, have been you know, successful with weight loss and a lot of people that I've seen. Um, WW, which is now, or it's called WW now, it was formerly Weight Watchers as we know it. So people are based uh, or allowed points based on your nutrition goals. And I put down 23 points per day here as some of my colleagues follow WW. And this was kind of their average for female, how many points they were allowed a day. So the nice, per, the nice part of this diet is that you get to choose how you spend your points for the day. So foods up here like salmon, Chicken, fruits and veggies have zero to very few points, maybe two or three, something like that. But you see a small blizzard at Dairy Queen is 29 points. So that puts you over your day right there. Um, so basically you can choose how you spend your points and that gives you the control and the power, which is desirable. This is the DASH diet. You probably have heard of this. The dietary approach is to stop hypertension it has been intended for people to lower their blood pressure without medication, but it also has some weight loss benefits as well. It emphasizes fruits, veggies, whole grains, and lower non-fat dairy while limiting saturated fat and cholesterol foods. So um, the, these photos are kind of small here, but it gives you an overview of what sort of foods are um, recommended on this eating plan. And then the Mediterranean diet, this one has also been around for a while um, based on the healthy lifestyle of those in Greece, Italy, Spain, and it talks about including healthy fats, avocado, olive oil, nuts, things like that, fish, limiting red meat, uh, limiting cheese, eating lots of vegetables. 
All right. So just a, a quick recap of what we talked what we talked about. I actually, as a dietitian, am curious about these different eating patterns. So a few years back, I tried well, I tried vegan first for January a few years ago to see if I could make it a whole month with my husband, and that was tough. And then I also tried the keto diet a few summers ago, and I only lasted two and a half weeks. So that was really tough. Um, I felt very restricted. You know, it was very different from the way I'm used to eating. Um, it was kind of fun at the beginning, but you know, it was such a change that it wasn't maintainable for me and, um, I couldn't keep up with it in general diets. If you, if you try to follow a restrictive diet, they're pretty hard to follow for most people. Um, that sense of restriction is not easy to follow long-term and people often go back to their old patterns. Um, some people, the restrictions work really well for, but not most people. So um, what I recommend if you're looking at a certain diet, like keto diet or something else like that, maybe consider one or two aspects of a, of a diet you're interested in, interested in that you could incorporate into your daily life. Like for the, the vegan diet for me, now I make some vegetarian or vegan recipes with lentils or other things like that um, once in a while, but I just incorporate a few things um, into, my, into my daily routine as opposed to all or nothing approach. You know, Katie, can I ask, I know those are, let's say, tough to be compliant to oftentimes, um, you know, what? when we'll just use, you know, vegan or, or uh, keto as two examples, but what, and maybe I, maybe this is a precursor for your next section, but um, how about those as they relate from a safety perspective, uh, you know, with those and maybe some of the others as well? Good question. So vegan, I don't see any, any concerns with the keto diet that has been brought up to me by different physicians about safety. Um, most often in terms of kidney disease or kidney donors, um, because of, of the, the change in the protein a little bit, or the higher fat, um, people with high cholesterol ask, can I do this diet safely? Um, we, we usually say no, you know, it's so extreme. We just don't want to tax any, any system of your body too much. Um, so the general consensus I give is no for keto. Okay. And, mm -hmm. you know, really, if we look at this, you know, knowing our population well, the transplant and LVAD population, uh, so many of us are challenged with, with kidney function whether initially as part of transplant or down the road, um, you know, because those can decrease over time. And the question becomes, and I apologize for, as we all know what it's like to work from home these days, with, uh, pets, uh, but what, what um, are there, you know, aspects in some of those that we should also be careful for because they could be detrimental to our kidneys, knowing that, you know, we need to kind of collectively look out for those as well. The only comment I could make is if people are trying to follow a lower carb diet, which is, which I think is actually helpful for weight loss in a lot of people, not the same as the keto diet, but um, a diet which includes, you know, lots of vegetables, a good amount of protein, just in general, less rice, potatoes, sweets, you know, sugary drinks. So just that loose general restriction of lower carb people are intent, you know, trying to eat more protein to make up for that. So too much protein, um, whether it's from foods or like a protein drink or supplements can stress your kidneys. So that's something to, to ask your team about, you know, what's the right amount of protein based on your kidney function. Yeah. You know, I, I think, and in fact, um, one thing that it's like, you know, there's a lot, there's, a, there's with my own history. I know there's, there's several do's and don'ts there. Um, and there is a difference between a plant-based protein and an animal-based protein. Is that, is that correct? Is you're that right. Correct? You're right. Um, that goes into more detail in general. It, it, the type of protein does make a difference, but the amount also, it's kind of twofold there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Good to yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. So uh, what does the research say? And we're just going to look at a few different articles. You'll notice they are, 10, 15 years old, but they still still um, have good points and not much has changed in terms of research on weight loss. 
So an article in the New England Journal of Medicine from 2009 looked at four different diet macronutrient compositions. So a low fat average protein, low fat high protein, high fat average protein, and high fat high protein. All diets included a 750 calorie per day deficit and all diets were equally successful in promoting weight loss. But after 12 months, all groups slowly regained. Then a 2005 uh, study in the International Journal of Obesity found that both diet, which they define here as calorie restriction in general, and exercise produce a greater weight loss than just diet alone. 2008 New England Journal of Medicine looked at three eating styles, low fat diet with a calorie restriction, Mediterranean diet with calorie restriction, and a low carb diet without calorie restriction. All groups lost weight, but the weight loss was greater in the low carb and Mediterranean groups. The last study that I looked at was in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2005, found that 20% of people who lose weight are successful at maintaining their weight loss after one year. So a lot of people you know, end up regaining their weight. So the people that were able to maintain their weight after the year, they reported a lot of exercise one hour per day. They didn't really say what kind of exercise, what intensity, a low calorie, low fat diet, having breakfast, watching their weight or weighing themselves regularly, and then also being consistent on the weekdays and the weekends. So overall, these, are, these studies looked at a lot of different eating patterns or diets, um, but really the consensus or the conclusion I make from this one size does not fit all. So there's, there's a lot of diet trends out there or suggestions on how to lose weight or be healthier and uh, what, what may work for one person may not work for another person. There's a lot of factors we don't quite understand that play into a weight loss or maintaining weight. So um, that's all I have to say about that, that it's, it's not conclusive. Okay, so the next section, I wanna to touch a bit on food safety. Uh, this is for transplant recipients because of the immunosuppression medication. So as we know that transplant recipients are immunocompromised, immunosuppressed, which means you're at an increased risk for foodborne illness. So someone who's had a transplant is 15 to 20% more susceptible to getting food poisoning than the general population. And 18% uh, of transplant recipients had a documented episode of foodborne illness within five years of transplant. So that's only documented illnesses. Um, some people end up in the hospital because the symptoms are so severe. Um, other people don't document it at all and, and they, they uh, recover on their own. You know, Katie, I'll, I'll let you, uh, you know, to share with everybody, that's a real thing. Uh, having gotten it myself, I, you can put me in that statistic. And um, I thought I was at a safe restaurant and everything. And, uh, you know, I actually had a similar dish that other people had. and I was the only person sick. There you go. That's exactly what I say to people all the time is you, you may eat, uh, the same thing as your friend or colleague, um, and they may be fine because their immune system can fight it off, but you may not be, and you may get sick. You're more vulnerable to that. So great example. Um, and there's only so much we can do, really. We educate a lot about uh, food safety after transplant, high-risk foods, things to not do, um, but really we can't control everything. You know, things, some things may still happen, but we can do the best we can. So thinking about the holiday season, I want to give a few examples, some tips about food safety. So this is a picture of raw cheese. So I'm um, thinking about like cheese platters and cheese spreads and things like that. So um, as we know, raw or the same word is unpasteurized. Those sort of cheeses um, have a higher risk for foodborne illness or bacterial content than a pasteurized cheese. So when you're looking at cheeses, it's helpful to look at the back under ingredients. It, it should say raw or pasteurized, it should uh, differentiate that. This one, it says raw, you know, raw cheese on it a few times. Um, and, but of note, if you are cooking the cheese, like in like a cheesy potato dish or something like that, and it's raw, you know, there's no risk for bacteria after it's been cooked. Um, but just wanted to point this out because I was shopping at Target, I think, and I picked up a, a block of cheese and thinking it was um, pasteurized. It's at Target, it has to be, it's a mainstream store. And I got home and 
I was pregnant at the time, so I couldn't have raw cheese and it was raw, so I couldn't have it. Um, that was a surprise to me. I thought they had to have pasteurized cheese there. Um, so double check at the label. Um, more often you find raw cheeses at specialty stores like Whole Foods or Lunds and Byerly's, but you just never know. Um, another common holiday thing people like to make is homemade eggnog. So that if you're making it with just standard eggs out of the carton, those are not pasteurized and they do carry a risk for salmonella. Although it is only about one in 20,000 eggs contain salmonella. So recommendation is to use pasteurized eggs, which the liquid egg beaters are pasteurized. Those are safe or finding a pasteurized carton of eggs, which is kind of hard to do. Um, I haven't seen it at all stores. Um, you have to look on the label. If, if it doesn't say anything, it's not pasteurized. Um, and of note, uh, organic or free range does not mean the same as pasteurized. So those still carry a, a bacterial risk as well. And then another thing, um, pickled herring, that's something that's not cooked. It is cured and brined with salt. So again, a, a higher risk food that I think of around the holidays. Okay, so this is more about food safety. Um, the, the furthest point on the left is talking about washing meat and poultry. So some people do that, but it is not advised due to risk for cross-contamination. And there was a USDA study asking people, well, why do you wash your meat? 30% said it was to remove slime or something else on the meat. 28% uh, said habit. 19% said family routine. And another 19% to remove germs or some bacteria. But they did look at um, results of bacteria after cooking chicken thighs and then making a salad. So 60% of people still had bacteria in their sink after washing um, chicken in the sink to remove something from it. 14% still had bacteria after they attempted to sanitize, which is pretty, pretty um, interesting to me. And then there was somehow some contamination of lettuce in a quarter of the people. All right, so just some other um, tidbits. So produce, um, okay to just wash with uh, water. You don't need to use detergent or any special vinegar washes or anything else that has been advertised to clean produce. Water is just fine. In fact, detergent um, could be harmful. And the fact if it penetrates like an apple or something like that, um, the chemicals or the detergent can get inside, which you can consume. So, so Katie, can I ask on that note, um, you know, when I went through my, I recall from my food safety discussions post immediately post transplant, you talked about, you know, certain fruits and vegetables that would harbor bacteria more than others. I think the most notorious was probably um, uh, strawberries from what I recall. And perhaps you, you can list, there's, I'm sure there's a few to be especially careful of. And I remember right after transplant that, that at least my takeaway was, you know, just stay away from some of that stuff, at least immediately, but then down the road, it was okay. Uh, but back to this washing, and, and I think we'd appreciate your, your commentary on what I just mentioned. So it's a two-parter. What are your thoughts about that? The second is, you know, I'll, I'll be candid. I'm still leery about having stra raw strawberries, fresh strawberries, just because of the bacteria potential within the pits. And you know, is running tap water enough or is that something that I should I have justification for being a little leery about? What's your thoughts on that kind of whole area there? Right. So I'm not quite sure. Are you um, the way you phrased the first part made me think of like the dirty dozen, which is an organic versus conventional type thing. So um, you're right, like berries and foods like that with a like no skin or any type of barrier. Um, could have pesticides or something like that if they're conventionally grown, whereas like a banana, you don't need to worry about it really because you're peeling it anyway um, and you're not eating that outer part. Um, so that's looking at pesticides, um, not necessarily bacteria. I do hear some of my patients, they come into their transplant eval and they've heard from, I'm not quite sure what the source is, but they've heard, oh, I can't have fruits and veggies after transplant. And I'm not quite sure where that's coming from. Um, you're right. So the question is, is running tap water enough? And I'm on a listserv for transplant dietitians across the country. And this has come up a few times. People are asking the same question as you. Can I just do running tap water? That's what's recommended, but it doesn't seem like it's enough. And that's what everyone is recommending, just tap water. Um, 
Still, again, there's things out of our control, like all the lettuce E. coli outbreaks. I mean, that's a risk people are taking. Um, we Even if we do the best, there's still that chance of E. coli or, you know, there's melons that have outbreaks, different things like that. So I usually recommend it's okay to have fruits and vegetables, but if you don't feel comfortable um, or there's a recent outbreak, of course, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Um, Food delivery. So I just want to comment on that real quick. That's uh, increasingly common now with COVID. I know I use it myself now just to, number one, save time, but to not go to the store, not um, be around other people. Um, but we need to think about, you know, each service is different. Um, are they doing several orders at once and then yours is sitting in the car for a while until it's delivered? Are they delivering it right away? You know, make sure you're, you're at home waiting for the order um, if possible. Um, so I know there, those are some different questions to ask about, you know, a, a window of time for delivery or is it more like a half an hour, one hour delivery? Um, we just don't know what happens behind the scenes. So that's worth exploring more. Um, and then also there's no known COVID spread due to packaging. So I know that was first a concern um, back in the spring, but it's been determined now that it cannot spread due to packaging. So we don't need to wipe off all our packages or disinfect things, which I was doing at the beginning as well. So. Okay, um, the danger zone. So this kind of goes back to potential food sitting in someone's car for a while. Um, there's several other scenarios this can apply to, but the danger zone is 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's if food is sitting out at those temperatures out of the fridge for more than two hours, it can go into the danger zone. So think of potlucks, picnics, salad bar, the deli counter, holiday gatherings now, although probably less likely to have a, an abundance of food with COVID this year, but still worth noting. I you know some people bring over food for the holidays and they let it sit out on the counter until it's time to eat. There's not enough room in the fridge or the oven or what have you. Um, so something to think about, you know, serve up your food right away to ensure it's fresh. Sometimes that helps put your plate then in the refrigerator to keep it within that safe temperature zone. Um, think about other people. No, not everyone, like your uncle, may follow the same food safety practices as you. They may keep their food in the garage until they go to the holiday. With winter, not as much of a concern, hopefully, but in the summer, you just never know. Um, so think about putting hot or cold packs in your food, um, doing the best you can with a group of people. You know, Katie, could I uh, ask you a question back on your previous uh, topic? Um, so you mentioned delivery. Um, how about takeout? Yeah, yep. So takeout, um, I mean, again, hopefully it is it is cooked fresh, you know, and not sitting around for a while. In general, for after transplant, the main ticket items to avoid is a buffet or salad bar, deli counter, things that we know are probably sitting out and are they regulated like they should be? Uh, not always. Whereas buffet, people say, um, we'll just go right in the morning, you know, it's fresh then. Well, not always. Maybe they mix it with the food the night before. I've heard of that happening too. You just, you just never know. Um, but takeout or like sit down restaurants, theoretically, that should be, should be a little safer. Um, never say never, but um, usually I'm fine recommending takeout or sit down restaurants. If you have special needs, you can always ask to um, ask them questions about how long it, you know, if it's sitting out before you pick it up, things like that. Right. Okay, so on to the, the final topic about holiday eating strategies. So this is geared mostly towards sodium, which applies, um, of course, to the heart population, but also for those who have kidney um, issues or kidney dysfunction of any kind. So sodium, our favorite topic, of course, everyone <laughs> loves to talk about sodium. Um, but there was an article in 2019 that talked about excessive salt consumption, that it may only be one factor in triggering acute post-holiday heart failure. And other factors were nutritional as well, including overeating, drinking too much alcohol, emotional stressors, uh, not exercising, and then not going to the doctors regularly, postponing those visits. Um, this article noted an increase in heart failure admissions immediately following the holidays. So interesting fact that I learned there. This is from the Tufts I, University. I, uh, yeah, um, no, go ahead. 
Yep, no problem. On the salt and sodium notion, um, those that have an LVAD and those of us who previously had severe heart failure, uh, we're always instructed to have a, what I'll call a very low sodium diet. Uh, those post-transplant, would you call that a very low sodium diet or just a low sodium diet? You know, understanding there's degrees or is it something that, well, we don't even have to be that mindful for, you know, so kind of think of it maybe like in the thirds there and three categories. What's your point of view on, on kind of that progression? Right. So um, pre-transplant or people on a low sodium diet, um, I recommend as a low sodium diet, 1500 to 2000 milligrams per day. And I know some people would argue lower than that. Um, but the reason I say um, lower isn't always better is I've seen people try to get as low as they can, 500, 1000 milligrams per day, and then they have worse side effects. They retain more fluid. There's a, a mechanism where you go too low and your body compensates for that. So um, I guess there's a comment on that. And then after transplant, um, I, use, I don't say there's a, a real restriction anymore, but people are, you know, cautious. They've been eating this way for a while, and that's certainly fine to continue. There's no harm. I wouldn't go off the deep end the other way too. Uh, I don't really give specific numbers, but an average person, you know, like myself or someone without um, needing to follow a sodium restriction, 3,000 milligrams per day is just fine. So unless your physician were to recommend something lower for another reason, that's pretty standard after transplant. <laughs> Um, so Thanksgiving and Christmas meals, interesting. They can total like 3000 to 4,500 calories per day. And this, there's a wide range here in calories based on um, alcohol consumption and portion size. Those play into calories adding up much quicker from Thanksgiving through new year's, a typical American adult has 550 extra calories a day, mostly from starches and meats, which contribute to five to eight pound weight gain. So there's really a perfect storm here going on with high calorie, low fiber food, which contributes to, you know, eating more before you feel full. A lot of people tend to give up or resign their typical eating patterns during the six week time, um, you know, splurging, thinking I earned it. This is a great time. Um, you know, let's just take a little bit of a break. Uh, what, what harm can it do? But it can lead to more severe consequences with medical issues at stake. So I'm all about for the splurge, the quality of life is huge. You know, I am all for telling people have pizza once in a while, you know, go for it. We just got to enjoy ourselves. But if that's how people are thinking every day, that can end up um, poorly sometimes. So here's a comparison. Um, I wanted to look at ham. So ham's a pretty common Christmas food now that we're coming up on Christmas uh, holiday. Um, a honey baked ham, probably pretty typical, similar to other hams, but six ounces is probably a typical portion size or more. But the, the amount here for the sodium is more than 2000 milligrams in that portion alone. Think about all the other foods you're eating on top of that as well. I try to find like a lower sodium uncured or something of that sort ham. This Dietz and Watson one I did find took quite a bit of searching to find it. Um, I think Co Cub and Coborns sell it. Um, but the, the same portion size has about a third of the sodium as maybe a, a more traditional ham. You know, so that's Katie, just while we're talking, continue to talk about sodium. One question came up um, along the lines: someone who might be um, pre-LVAD with heart failure, post-LVAD, does it change at all due to a heart pump? Any, the sodium change from pre to post-LVAD? Yeah, like someone who has actually has so they they've got you know, they've got a better res restored um, ejection fraction for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into specific numbers, but, but right. their EF was, was totally in the basement. And now they have like some, you know, usable EF, I'll call it. I don't know what the right medical term is. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, sodium, their, the view on sodium, any different across that? No, I pretty much stick with roughly around the same amount, whether it's for an LVAD, you know, pre-LVAD versus post or waiting for a transplant, all within around 2,000 milligrams per day, give or take a little bit. Great, thank you. Some other higher sodium items to look at for the holiday. 
uh, deli meat sandwiches, finger sandwiches for um, like appetizer spread or, you know, an order of platter, salted nuts, you know, other condiment or snacky items like pickles or olives are pretty salty, of course. Dinner rolls, it's not just the, the meat or the cheese on those sandwiches, it's the bread. People often overlook that bread is pretty high in salt. Canned goods, so that's canned beans or canned vegetables, canned soup, things like that, that are going into our dishes or a component of a dish. Um, let's see, the last one on here is chip dips, you know, other snacky foods. Chips and the dip, all of it is pretty salty. Those are just a few examples. Um, overall tips to reduce the sodium, of course, I mean, the seasonings, we all know this, using a low or no sodium seasoning. Um, Mrs. Dash, Penzi's, Tastefully Simple, have some good blends um, that have no sodium, a, a wider variety. Of course, just using different um, herbs on its own too. And then there's the question of salt substitutes, which people often ask about. There, that would be like Morton light salt or new salt, no salt. They're white particles. It still looks like salt, but they take the, the salt out and put potassium in to kind of retain the same flavor profile. And those are generally okay for people unless your kidneys are compromised, um, especially if you have a high blood potassium level that can make it worse. Um, so I, that's more an in, in individualized uh, scenario there. Um, we talked about the ham and the sodium already in the ham, but you know people sometimes add extra glazes on top, which could compound the sodium, of course. So try to think of a, a way to um, reduce the sodium in the glaze. So a common one is glazing your ham with brown sugar and orange or pineapple juice for like a sweet, sweet and salty tang there. Butter. So this is a this is something I don't usually worry about because um, one tablespoon of salted butter has like 90 milligrams of sodium. So it's really not a big deal when people say, oh, I put a little bit of salted butter on my bread. Should I do unsalted? And to me, it doesn't matter. It's a small drop in the 2000 milligram per day bucket. But when you're cooking with it on the holidays, that's something to reconsider. You know, putting a stick or two in mashed potatoes, you know, I put a stick of butter in my mashed potatoes for four people. So imagine like double that amount or 10 people. Um, or cookies, you know, baked goods. People don't realize sometimes that those have a lot of salt. Um, so when you're cooking in those types of scenarios, it may be wise to swap even at least half the butter for unsalted, if not all of it. Okay, and then this is a, a picture of different types of salt. So these are just a few, but there's a lot of you know, fancy salts out there on the market now. The top one um, is just plain table iodized salt. The, the middle one is sea salt and the bottom is pink Himalayan salt. So I often hear people say, well, I use sea salt, you know, I'm not taking in as much sodium, it's healthier for me. Um, but really per volume, if you grind them all down to the same particles, it does have the same sodium Per, per amount or per volume. So they're pretty equal in terms of sodium and uh, the concerns around that. You know, one thing, um, I'll, I'll help you on that. Uh, the experience I had in the, in the kidney dialysis world, kidney transplant world, um, that I think people can relate to. Um, I, I met some people there, uh, and by people, I mean, there, this was a trend uh, that they were dealing with in that world of people really thought that they could have all the sea salt because it was fine because it was sea salt. Uh -huh. um, and there's a lot of education that was continually happening in that world. Thankfully, I know folks who are on the call today have been through some of you know this basic understanding is a salt is a salt is a salt. Uh, you know, sodium is sodium is sodium, regardless of its source. And, you know, Katie, if you have any comments on that, I mean, that was just my, my experience that I thought was worth sharing. No, you hit it right on the head. I mean, I hear that all the time uh, for kid, my kidney eval patients. Oh, don't worry. You know, I add sea salt. It's all good. I don't have to worry about it. It's, it's basically a moot point. Um, no, like what you said, it's all, it's all the same. And, you know, the body recognizes it as sodium, not if it's pink or white or sea salt or what have you. So you're right. Um, okay, broth. So I, I, I like this visual. So broth is something, you know, we don't really think too much about, or maybe some of us do, but um, thinking about homemade soups this time of the year, you know, it's, it's healthier to make your own soup um, if you enjoy it. 
And broth is one thing that really can make or break it in terms of sodium. So if you're using your leftover turkey or ham to make soup, um, you know, think about broth. So on the left, we have regular broth and only one cup of the broth has around 900 milligrams of sodium. So that container, I think, has like six or eight cups in it. So that would be like your whole batch of soup or something, a ton of sodium there. Then the middle one is like a reduced sodium, still really salty, though, at over 500 milligrams per cup. And then unsalted, which I, I've seen newer now in the stores, but that's around 40 milligrams per cup. And you may ask, well, that gosh, that's going to taste terrible. Um, why even bother? I've actually had people say the unsalted is better than the middle one here, the, the reduced sodium. I haven't tried it myself, but I do cook with the middle one, the less sodium. Still pretty salty. Um, maybe do a mixture of both, you know, maybe some less sodium, some unsalted, something like that. But thinking about homemade soup or other things around the holidays, um, this can really add up. And uh, by making a simple swap, you can make a difference there. Okay, and then I just put a few slides with some recipe ideas in a holiday focused recipes. Um, I calculated the sodium per serving. Glenn will have the links to these um, afterwards. Um, so this is a green bean casserole and it's only 250 milligrams per serving for sodium and it uses unsalted butter and a reduced sodium broth. So if you were to choose an unsalted broth, the sodium would come down even further on that. And then a uh, potato au gratin with Swiss cheese. So a lot of us have learned that Swiss or mozzarella, those sort of cheeses that have less sodium than like a cheddar or Parmesan. Um, so that's why this is using Swiss, but it's only 55 milligrams per serving and it serves eight. So that's pretty good. And then again, back to the soup. So a split pea soups is one of my favorite. And this you can make in a low sodium fashion with low sodium broth, unsalted butter, things of that nature. Okay, some final holiday eating considerations. So I was asking my husband, like, do you have any recommendations for me to pass on to um, the attendees today? And gosh, I love baking. So just last night I was making cookies for my daughter's birthday and um, I have to only make like half a batch, you know, just because I'm bored nowadays, I just wanna bake. Um, but if I have a whole batch, there's only two of us who are eating them really. And um, they, they disappear much quicker than, than we want. So. Um, I, I only do half a batch and my husband said, maybe make a cookie cap, right? So allow yourself only like two or three cookies per day. Now, for some of you that maybe sounds like a lot, like, oh, you're gonna let us eat two cookies a day, but maybe have a, some kind of boundary or guideline in your head. That mental stop point sometimes helps us. Um, so if you, if you have that there, maybe that would prevent from eating too many holiday cookies or something like that. Again, kind of on the same premise, avoid making too much food. So this year, especially only having small gatherings, you know, and you wanna make all the side dishes, 10 side dishes or whatever it is, um, we're bound to have leftovers, even if they're small portions of all those side dishes. So really think ahead, do you really need to make potatoes for 20 people, maybe make a smaller batch. Um, so you don't have leftovers, you're not tempted to eat them for the next week or so. Um, and if you do have some leftovers, try to freeze some of them so you're not tempted by some of those foods. Um, again, I'm all about the splurge. Um, we gotta enjoy our holiday time, but instead of the six week splurge that can end kind of poorly, like we learned earlier, maybe limit it to a few days over the holiday season, maybe Christmas, you know, another day here and there, maybe three to five days total. Uh, but maybe once you're done with that day, then reset the next day, limit, limit it to just one day. And then I just threw in here, take a walk over the holidays. This has been a family tradition of mine after a normal Thanksgiving before dessert, my whole extended family of like 30 people would go walk around outside in St. Cloud in the snowy, icy streets. You know, it wasn't very fun, but we did it anyway. And now um, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, or Christmas morning, it's just something to get out and do some exercise. So this photo here on the left is of me and my dog, Bob Barker. We went on a walk um, on Christmas in the snow a few years back. You know, he loves it, um, but it's just something to break up the day. You know, Katie, those are great. I think that uh, you could have actually, uh, you know, actually even used the name pandemic eating considerations. And there you go. Yeah. Right? Uh, yep. Boy, we should have had you back in June when we were wondering what we were doing, huh? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. I think, I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so... 
this quote I found, and I, I kind of liked it, the best way to prevent post-holiday remorse is develop strategies ahead of time to prevent overconsumption. So thinking ahead, um, we, we are able to take able to take control of both the food, what we're making and the environment. So kind of touch on those things already, but um, that's one thing and all this stuff we can't control right now, whether it's medical things or the world pandemic, there's a lot going on out of our control. And some people find it helpful to know what you're putting in your body. You can control. Um, maybe we don't need to control it hundred percent of the time, but maybe 75% of the time. Um, something like that is something to think about. Um, looking ahead at New Year's resolution. So we all need a reset. We are all looking forward to 2021. Um, people often like to do New Year's resolutions to get a jump start on the new year, which is great. But, you know, take caution. Again, um, most people go gung ho and they last for a month or so. Um, they're excited. They want something new, fresh year. But uh, again, sometimes less is more. So think about a few small things that maybe fit into your day, although they're not overwhelming or just super exciting. Um, a change, a change is a change. So I put a few up here, you know, vegetables as a dietitian, I, I really don't like vegetables. To be honest, I'd rather eat pizza, but I force myself to eat like, you know, vegetables every day just to get it down. Sometimes like, Oh, I, you know, I, I'm going to grab this bell pepper for a snack instead of, you know, something else. Um, so sometimes it's not out of enjoyment, but try to clock in with myself and do that. So maybe that's something I want to eat more vegetables, a frozen bag of vegetables with dinner a few times a week. Um, something to think about there. Uh, walking outside, you know, getting exercise in the winter, something to get out of the house, but you're maybe thinking, well, it's too cold. It's too icy. I'm going to fall down. Um, maybe purchase some warm clothes. So that's not a barrier anymore or some spikes for your shoes. So you can walk safely. Um, think about those things that would prevent you from doing what you want. Um, and then another one, drink more water. I just threw up another example, but um, that's something that most of us could um, could do depending on our medical status, of course. 